I remember being on the plane, being really scared because I think it was the first time. I was seven years old when I came to America, and it was the first time that I was on a plane, and we literally tried to take everything of value, everything that meant anything to us. We were like really scared about not only facing our new home or what was to be our, our, our new home, at least for you know, the foreseeable future, because our, our father was going to university, just scared about having left Iran for the first time and gone somewhere you know, that we knew was going to be completely different. I saw that there was like room for a lot of opportunity you know, to, to eventually present itself. And, and I saw that had I stayed in Iran, I probably would have done what was expected of me and done what everybody else had always done, which is, you know, become a doctor, become an engineer, um, become a lawyer, you know. And in America, I felt more freedom to express myself in creative ways that maybe had I stayed in Iran, I wouldn't have been able to do. Since I used to be English teacher, the, I was helping Ali to learn the language, which he picked up pretty quick. Uh, the only uh, time that uh, Ali and Arash had a hard time was uh, there was a hostage crisis in Iran, and they were uh, kids and they didn't know anything. And at the school, although the school staff was were very understanding and supportive of, the, of them but the the children at the school couldn't understand it so they were giving ali and arash a really hard time so they made them practically miserable so that was the time that they needed a lot of help uh, ali was uh, an average actually uh, at school uh, there there were some subjects that he was pretty uh, great, but the rest he didn't pay attention simply because uh, he was in love with music. With help of his friend Brian Transom, BT, he was his classmate. Eventually, he went into the music he loved very much, and he constantly continued his interest. They, they saw it as a side hobby. I don't think they ever realized that he would pursue it as a career. And at the time, it was sort of in the nascent stages. I mean, it was pre-EDM, if you will. I mean, DJs were not on magazine covers, DJ, especially in America. You know, it was, it was a real sort of underground career path. And I think my parents at the time were worried. They were really hesitant about him um, moving into that you know, that is a full-time career. I think that they initially, I think their initial um, feelings were probably disappointment. He came to me and actually requested, Mom, if you allow me to pull out and focus uh, all my attention to, to my music, I, I feel I'm going to be somebody. And after a long conversation, uh, I agreed that for him, to focus one year on his music more than his education. And that was actually the year that it, everything turned around. And at, by the end of the year, he proved to himself and to me that this is really a special talent that he has got. The closeness of family really has kept me grounded over the years. I think had I not had that, I probably would have you know, fall in with the wrong crowd, maybe gone off the deep end with um, the excessive partying, um, the, 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 the crazy nightlife. That's basically, you know, a part of my scene. Um, but those core family values kept me, you know, on the right path.
Ali used to spin hip hop, um, house, acid jazz, and funk, and I used to spin reggae. And through all those genres, I gave the flavor and the mic. Before then, this was unheard of. This never had been done before, as far as you have an MC, you know, toasting over acid jazz music, hip hop, and stuff. It, it never been done before. My, my little brother, my younger brother, threw a party at a place here it called, it was, it was a pizza shop basically called Milos. And he closed it down and, 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 and rented it at night and you know, begged me to have Ali play because Ali was a sick hip hop DJ. Actually, the first time I heard the music, I remember asking people, I'm like, what is this? Who is this? And uh, there was a DJ up there next to a Jamaican guy who was rapping and uh, Everyone told me that there's a guy named Dubfire, and uh, they're playing what's called acid jazz. And so essentially, he started playing acid jazz, from what I recall. When we started off, Washington was a ghost town, literally a ghost town. You can count the clubs on one hand, and every club have their own specific ways of doing things. We came in young and radical and transformed the whole thing but we were the first to go into a, a club or a restaurant and make it into a club for that one night. Uh, we happened to be about maybe two and a half blocks away from the place that I first met him. Well, it was called the Down Under Restaurant, but we, uh, I used to have a night, uh, Friday and Saturdays, we used to have a night called call Exodus. And uh, he came in, uh, he's a very quiet guy actually, you know, uh, for the kind of noise he made with the turntables, he's a very quiet guy. <laughs> and uh, very focused, didn't say much. I mean, he came and did his thing and uh, on a regular basis within the years, you know. Uh, but I remember the first time he just came with his record back and started playing, but he, uh, you know, very, very uh, down to earth, but very focused. Wouldn't participate too much in, with the crowd, but every time you would go back and listen to him, the music would change. I felt like it just got better and better every week. And Sharam kept coming at Exodus with, but you know, Sharam's music was completely a different uh, kind of a background, you know, which, which I respect 100%, but it was a, a great combination because I understood Ali's music was more bottom heavy, bass oriented music, whether it's slow or fast, it's very bottom heavy. And the thing with Sharam, he has, he has the melodic aspect of, of music. So I, I thought when they were kind of partnering up, I'm like, this could be a great combination. And you know, and then obviously we saw it blossom to this thing that what was known as this deep dish. Great. We met through a mutual friend at a party. We were booked to play the same party and we just hit it off musically and decided to create deep dish and here we are. It's like a marriage. Some days you hate it, some days you love it. Yeah. Yeah, because you know right. <laughs> in the beginning they were they started they met each other but then when they started as a friend uh, Ali uh, first he made his room as his studio and then Sharam used to be with Ali in our home almost all the time and since both of them loved Persian, Persian meal and Persian food so I was always ready to make them food and they used to go to that little room and work with each other. You act like brothers somehow, don't you? You feel like brothers? brothers? Yeah. Yeah. I always wanted to have a twin brother, you know, because I thought it would be cool. And then God gave me this guy, so. Yeah, right, right. It's wicked. Which, uh, I'm regretting. You know, they said be careful what you ask for. Um, when he was, that was just at the start, when he was deep dish with Sharam, I think in 1993, I used to go to his resident party, which was a State of the Union, a small bar in Washington, D.C. I was at university. And um, this was a gig where him and Sharam had to assemble all everything, all the equipment, all the speakers, CD players, turntables, and they had to play from beginning to end. And they probably got like, well, I don't know how much, but I'm guessing like $150 to play the whole night, both of them together. Well, needless to say, things have changed. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I know I, we go way back and um, even though things have changed a lot, it's nice to see that he has.
I want to say quiet, but that's not the right word. He was always the deep in the dish, in the deep dish equation. So he was sort of the deeper guy. Um, I think as a DJ, um, you know, he liked he liked reggae and hip hop sounds. Um, he obviously had friendships with many of the local DJs, but you know, he was sort of always the the deeper part of that. They were the biggest DJ duo um, in the world at the time. They were on magazine covers. They were headlining the best festivals. They, their music was number one. You know, anytime they put a, a, a tune out, it was number one at Winter Music Conference. It was number one on the UK charts. Um, they started getting mainstream US press. And again, this is like sort of pre-EDM, pre Skrillex and Dead Mouse on Rolling Stone. Um, this is, you know, 2005, 2006. So, um, it the industry was was just sort of emerging in the in at least in the U.S. It wasn't getting the support that that it gets uh, now. It was really in sort of the embryonic stage. Um, and for them to achieve, you know, what they did with Madonna and all the remixes and 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 the touring was really significant at the time. Wednesday is one of the biggest nights for the musical world. It is Grammy night. There are several people from our area up for awards. One is the DC-based remix duo called Deep Dish. Deep Dish is Ali Shirazenia and Sharam Tahabi. They were just children when they immigrated here from Iran. Now the guys find themselves LA-bound, nominated for best remix recording of Dido's chart hit, Thank You. We take uh, a song, it could be a rock song, a pop song, any, any sort of uh, original material, and uh, we more or less reproduce it. We write our own music, our own drum programming on top of it, and we give it, give it our flavor. The uh, commercial side of things really came towards George's On, where you know Flashdance happened at some stage, and that was clearly the most most commercial record that they'd ever done. It wasn't really a commercial record because at the time it was crazy. It turned into a commercial formula after Flashdance was successful. But at the time that Flashdance started to be created, it was impossible to predict. It would not have been possible to uh, predict that that would be a commercially successful record. Madonna was doing a pre-tour event at the Roseland Ballroom in New York and wanted Deep Dish to open up for her. And the reason was a phone call, not, I guess, a fax or an email at the time, was this was all super secret, nobody could know, this was gonna be a surprise thing, blah, blah, blah. And uh, make a long story short, the guys ended up opening up for Madonna, phenomenally successful. And this was the precursor to her, to her uh, music tour at the time. And, um, you know, given that I was in New York, given that I was in such a small venue, this was Mana from Heaven for press. So the, you know, super media event. And um, two weeks later, I get this call from Versace saying that, oh, Donatello loves their sound and would they be willing to consider working um, on Versace's fashion shows? I call the guys up and uh, I had to do a lot of explaining and coaxing because they weren't really into commercial stuff like that at all. And um, they agreed. So we flew out to uh, Milan and then uh, did that show and it was crazy stuff. You know, he's, imagine sitting there. I, I, I went on, on those trips with him. Imagine sitting there with a fashion designer who's saying, I really want this to sound brown. It has to feel warm. Did, uh, did Deep Dish pave the way for Swedish House Mafia, David Guetta, Calvin Harris? I would say, yeah. And I think if you ask those guys, they would tell you, especially David Guetta, he's older. I think that, um, you know, Deep Dish influenced a lot of DJs. I remember being at Pacha, and I was like a, a big DJ in France, but nobody knew me really outside of France. And I remember saying hi to 
Ali and Sharam and going back to my agent and saying, oh my God, I just shake their hands. I, <laughs> and I was so excited because I shake hands to Ali and, and Divdesh. And it was such a big, a big deal for me to meet them. Um, Deep Dish was definitely one of the first, well, probably the first house music that affected us and um, that we heard, you know. It was Deep Dish and Armin Van Helden, I think, that really got us hooked in the scene. That was really like an American sound, sort of a club sound, that, that you really don't hear that much anymore nowadays. But it was so... I call it mouth music, because I'll show you. I can only show you what I mean with that. It's... I think that Ali and Sharam reached the natural life cycle of any creative partnership. I think that, you know, working together for almost two decades and constantly having to run every decision past another person, I think, um, you know, I think that kind of weighed uh, or placed its toll on them. And I think, um, they had both matured. I think that they had grown a lot over that time, and I think they were more definitive about what they wanted out of life. They were more definitive about what they wanted creatively. Um, and, you know, they were veterans at this point. So I think there was that conflict of values of what, you know, each direction um, Ali and Sharam wanted to go to. I think that was in conflict at the time. And he said, uh, by the way, Sharam and I fight a lot. <laughs> you're going to be spending a lot of time with us and you're going to see us go at it. Just excuse yourself from the room, step outside, hang out, uh, go down the street, get a beer, go smoke a cigarette, go do whatever you got to do. Eventually everything's going to kind of subside and, you know, we'll, we'll get back to work. You know, if you think about it, 10 years of touring, um, 10 years of having to be that close with the same person, you know, uh, it's difficult. You know, the studio relationship, the creative relationship, um, the magic that happened between them didn't come easy. It wasn't the type of thing where they sat in the studio and said, oh, that's a cool sound, yeah, let's use that. There were a lot of fights. I used to go for a walk, a lot. <laughs> You know, funny enough, thinking back to it, I don't know if it was that much of a surprise that they split. I think that, um, you know, there aren't that many DJ duos. And when you've been, when you've been together with your partner for as long as, as they had, um, then in a way, I think it was quite a natural thing. They, I think they felt they'd taken it as far as they could go. I think um, they both, you know, the more I got to know them better and the, and the, and the longer that relationship went on, um, they both had kind of, you, they were totally separate people. Um, they both did something different. I think it's very hard to find someone who doesn't, you know, isn't somehow attracted to, to money and fame. I think everybody wants it a little bit, uh, at least once in their life. And you, you have that chance, you go that way, and then you have to decide if it's for you or not. And uh, from my feeling and understanding with Ali is that he had an incredible ride and had a lot of fun. But at one point, found that there was something missing. And I think that's why he looked, you know, in another direction. Uh, not only musically, musically, but also for friendship and support and to, uh, some people would say to get back to the roots, but I think it was just, you know, get back to why he, why he got involved in this music in the first place. You know, we don't follow the rules and we see ourselves it's like, you know, I want to make it in music. And everybody tells you, no, but if you're going to work in music, it's not going to work. So many people, why would you, you have to be very lucky and you can make a living? I just say, no, I want it like that. And you just fight to make it like this. So I've, but at the same time, if you're not happy in a situation, you have to be honest enough to say, you know what, I'm at the peak. And you fuck it, fuck everything. I'm going to try it again from the beginning. I mean, I didn't think there was anything rocky about them. I just thought it was just two brothers that were together all the time and they wanted to kill each other, you know? And like, if you're together with the same person every day, you're gonna fight, like me and my partner, we fight all the time and we have disagreements. Um, that's all I sensed. I didn't sense anything like, you know, to what it became. But I didn't see it coming like that.
what I think is what he's done really well for himself. He, he, he got out of Deep Dish just at the right time where the techno scene would still embrace him. Because everybody in the techno scene know that's a really hard scene to get into because everybody's really cool, you know, and to be part of that scene, you gotta really say goodbye to any, anything that has to do with, with other than techno. And he did it really well. You want the real me, man, right? This is the real me. I'm gonna give you the real me. Whatever you want. Forget all your preconceived notions. This is Taipei, and this is Dubfire. Initially, there there was resistance. You know, in a lot of the club, uh, the techno scene is is very um, uh, clicky, right? They, um, they you have to kind of like show them that that you're one of them. Ali spent a lot of time convincing people that he was part of that new scene, and you know we had to help him do that. I remember him sometimes paying to play. So he would like be in the UK and then all of a sudden he has to go to like DC-10 and basically he would pay to fly himself, pay for his flight, his hotel, and then not get paid. So it's an interesting process to like build yourself down so you can build yourself better. And it's, you know, admiring to see somebody do that. Ali was coming to our parties. When I say our parties, it was in, in the early 2000s. Uh, I was, this is where my career started off, and I was playing this kind of uh, percussive, um, bringing minimal techno into it uh, before all this minimal s thing started. So he was coming to Ibiza, and, and, and I met him in the States, and I always paid my respect. Wow, Ali, you should do something like way back in time. And, why don't you, yeah, and he was like, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, 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 you're right. And then I remember him coming back from Ibiza after going to DC-10 and being like, nope, this is what we're doing. This is, this is the approach, this is what I wanna do. And he was so kind of blown away from that experience that um, it, it, was, it was really all he could see. You know, that was the only way that this was going to go down. Um, and, you know, we started working on records that, you know, were very much inspired from, from that trip and, you know, several others. And Roadkill, I think, was one of the turning points, uh, for sure. Um, there was a couple, you know, I think the Lucky Heather remix was another big turning point for him musically. And um, also Ribcage was probably, I think, the for me, for him, I think was one of the biggest turning points. Um, after that, I think he, it really helped solidify his sort of sound and style. And I feel like, you know, that record has a lot of Ali in it. I, I do remember that I asked Ali, he's like, can I release that? And he was like, no, you already gave it to Loco Dice, it's gonna be this lot number one. And I remember that really well because Ali's, uh, uh, I mean, he made some great music before and afterwards, uh, but he, uh, Ribcage was, was a track which kind of, um, was two tracks in one, you know? It's like, there was like a really different beginning to the very different end, and, and, but it made totally sense. And there you suddenly had a track that Put you on a journey. Not only the DJ set puts you on a journey, also the little drag puts you on a journey. When Ribcage came out, it was really it's such a defining sound. It was so unique, you know, and yet it worked so well. And it was also an, in, an inspiration of, of saying, hey, you know what, it doesn't matter where you are at any given point. If you have belief and talent, you can take it anywhere. And that's the beauty of this music, I guess. Electronic music gives you the ability to really become or create whatever you want. Um, and he showed it on a really high level and it showed guts and it showed excitement and it showed commitment. Um, and there was no doubt in my mind he would take it all the way to where he has taken it. I think the singles, when he put both of them out, I mean, people just, you know, people from Armin Van Buren to Tiesto to Richie Houghton, you know, um, were playing and I think people were really taken aback. Um, <clears throat> they, they were like, "Wow, where, where is this coming from?" You know, there was this darkness and this anger, um, and this new sound that people not only haven't didn't hear, but they weren't expecting from a guy that had done "Say Hello" and "Flash Dance." So, I think there was um, a real surprise, and I think there was real appreciation for his create, creative art. 
Also wird wahrscheinlich auch lebenslang einer der besten Klassiker sein, die es gibt. 100%. Der Track ist, ist, steht für sich. Der steht für sich und der stand auch in dem Moment, wo der rauskam, das war eigentlich auch so ein Umbruch von diesem ganzen minimal klicker ja. zu einem mehr Technoiden, trotzdem minimal gehaltenen, aber wieder straightforward, technoorientierten techno äh, ja. Sound. Und kam von Dubfire und ich habe ich hab dann irgendwie das Video gesehen auf YouTube, wo er dann sich äh, Boah, da stand er irgendwo, hat so ein bisschen Sci-Fi-mäßig irgendwie sich so äh, vorgestellt. Weißt du, weißt du wahrscheinlich nicht. Äh, und hab dann aber erst, glaube ich, ein halbes Jahr später so rausgefunden, dass das der von Deepish ist. Uh, I mean, it, it was like a what the fuck moment, you know, for me. I don't remember exactly what it was, when it was, but it was definitely, you know, when, when I, when I heard it, he came from another place. He really came from, from a place that a lot of techno records weren't coming from at the time, so. Uh, you know, I knew he had something. Sven ended up being one of the early supporters. Um, he put out Ali's first techno compilation on Cocoon. Um, he started to bring uh, Ali into Cocoon uh, nights in Ibiza or at the Cocoon Club. So uh, he was a strong supporter um, before Richie even was. And I think it was because he connected with how genuine and how, uh, how driven by creative reasons the transition was. That, that's why it worked, because it was genuine. They, they wanted me to stumble. Um, they wanted me to find my own way, but they weren't just watching me um, tr you know, fall apart, so to speak. Um, they were really there to give me like moral support, uh, friendship. Um, they were there to give me you know, creative advice, technical advice. Um, so I'm pretty indebted to those guys. Um, you know, and I'll never forget like what they did.
I work for Dovlar as a tour manager and babysitter and uh, party bringer. <laughs> and basically, I, I, I mean, the main thing is probably setting up all of the equipment um, and basically just making sure that everything runs smoothly from pickups, um, hotels, being, you know, dinners. Um, so he can basically just walk in, do the gig, um, feel comfortable, not having to worry about anything sort of technical, um, making sure that we're picked up, hotels are paid, dinner's looked after. Um, so basically he can just come and do his thing without having to stress about any of the small details. So it's my main part of the job. He's always been someone that really likes to push the limits of technology. Um, and it's really good working with him on that because, um, you know, we just always try to incorporate something new. So a lot of people uh, talk about my rattlesnake effect, which is just this uh, tape delay thing uh, that I have. And what I try to do a lot of times uh, is to create a new version of, of what I'm playing just by looping um, different songs together. And maybe I'll eventually, I mean, if I'm having too much fun just looping parts of a track, uh, I'll just leave it at that. And other times, Eventually, I'll, I'll kick in the track, and then it, it creates a yeah, pretty great feeling in the whole room. So, Mike, have you seen the fader plugs? Uh, That's insane. Yeah, tractor That's controller. controller. Yeah, for tractor, all four decks, everything. A B C D C. Yeah. That's something else. He has also great insight on the DJ business and also what the DJ really needs in the booth. So he's one of the guys that we like to talk to, even though I got to admit when we met, it was really more uh, private uh, and really just hang out and learn a little bit about uh, the DJ life and uh, maybe uh, the one of a manager of, a, of a, one of the uh, companies our, in our industry. まだ僕たちもそのアーティストさんたちと仕事をして2年ぐらいアリさんとかはもうちょっと長いですけどその間の中でいろいろこうフィードバックは聞いてじゃあ少しずつその改良してえー、っとさらにいいものを作っていこうとは僕たちの方からは思ってるんですアーティストさんの方からとしてみればまあ自分たちが本当に使いやすいものが手元にあれば、まあ、それだけで多分ハッピーになれると思いますし、まあ、それがまたあのその中にちょっとファッション性とか。そういうのがあれば余計そのモチベーションとかも上がっていくと思いますし、まあ、そういった観点でいいところがあればとお互いあればとは思いますけど。It's a powerful feeling. I mean, DJing can be extremely powerful. Um, you can be in a situation where you're in complete control of the crowd. Um, and that can make you feel, you know, uh, some people have thrown around that word and there was a faithless song, I remember, like God is a DJ or whatever. Um, but it can make you feel godlike in some ways. Um, when you're sort of above ground level, when you're, you know, in your pulpit. It can have a very, you know, powerful, powerfully spiritual effect on you to be in control of so many people. There's so many different parameters at play. There's so many different variables that sometimes are working with you, sometimes are working against you that you have to navigate through to find that point where, where you connect. And when you connect, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful, it's like the eye of the storm. You know, it's like uh, that calm, serene place that pilots have driven into, that scientists have discussed as a very unusual, very calm place in the middle of could be the worst storm in history. And that's what 
playing in a club is like, you know, because you're surrounded by all these things that there's people knocking things over around you, um, there's drinks falling on your laptop and, and on the mixer, and certain audience members trying to get your attention, you know, certain people behind you or the entourage of the, the promoter trying to get you to pose for photos and all this other stuff. And like, while all that's going on, while all that's happening around you, which is the, the hurricane, you're in the center of it all and you're trying to find that um, inner peace, that inner connectivity, not only w within yourself, but with the technology and ultimately with the, with the audience. And you're trying to bring people into that space. It's a very warm and inviting space to be in. DJ っていうのはまあダブファイヤーなりねアーティストがかける音楽に対してリアルタイムに映像をつけていくっていうような仕事になるんですけどまあそれが多分映像音楽がねグルーブを持ってるように映像もそれぞれこうグルーブだったりとか光の強さだったりパッションを持ったりとかしてまあそれをその瞬間瞬間でいいものを選んで。あの出してていいくっううような仕事です言われるのがあのミニマルにミニマルにっていう<笑>ワンワードだけなのでそれをあのまあ僕なりにねそのそのその時その時の,そのショーケースのタイミングに合わせてじゃあ,あのどういうグルーブ感の持つミニマルなのかミニマルにもいろいろあるだろうっていうようなね自分の,なねあのアイデアのまあ再発見みたいなところからスタートして。まあ、デザインワークを起こして、まあ、それをあの動きをつけて、まあ、現場の VJ の素材にしていくというような作業が大体やってる感じです。僕らはどっちかっていうとまあ日本人ならではの譲り合いみたいなのもあるのであの映像が派手になってる時はちょっと照明暗くしたりとか照明明るくしたら映像が暗くしてくれたりとかあとは色を合わせたりとかっていうことはある程度してますねそうですね彼はやっぱりその何ていうんですかねものすごくこう音に波を作るというかプレイに波を作るのねやるプレイの間はそういうものをちゃんと気をつけてあの自分もその波を壊さないように照明をやるようには手掛けてるんですけど例えばまあ暗くしてほしいとかこの時は盛り上げてほしいみたいな部分があのー、最近だともう何回もアリーさんの DJ, やあ DJ の時に照明やってるのでまあ分かってるんでまあそこら辺はお任せしてもらえてるんですけど
、フェスの場合はもう本当に盛り上げるためにとか、最初はもう暗いところから行って、一気にドーンって上げたりとかっていう照明をしたりとかっていうので、そこら辺が使い分けてはいますね。I think what's great about working with, with Ali is that, is that you know, he obviously travels a lot, he sees lots of things, he's very open-minded, he takes in lots of influences, and also he's willing to take a risk, you know? We tried to do a, th a 3D show for 4,000 people, <laughs> and we'd never done it before, we didn't know how it was going to work, and, uh, and we tried that, and, you know, and it worked, you know? But you don't always know how these things are going to work or not, or how much effect they're going to have. Sometimes, you know, you can have things that you, you don't expect to be a big deal or they're just almost something that just happens aside and that, and that suddenly becomes something of focus, you know. Um, but what's nice working with Ali is he's prepared to let those things happen. He's, he's not too um, uh, precious or controlling on things and he, he places a lot of trust in us. And I think because of that, um, he's got the best out of us, really. When people look at like how much maybe you get for a night to play a show and how long you play, maybe you play an hour or two, it's, it just seems like, wow, you make a lot of money. But then if you think about it, yeah, I just played an hour, but I spent eight hours to get to this club on 30 minutes sleep from the night before. And after this, it's going to take me 12 hours to travel home. Like if you scale that whole thing, you're getting paid like this much to, to make music and then this much for traveling and, and dealing with the music life, being maybe partying too much and half asleep on a plane and stuff like that. I don't think that people realize how much travel is involved until you really look at a DJ's entire schedule. Like if you're a club goer, you know, A, and you're sitting in Dubai, um, and Ali shows up to play a gig, you're like, wow, that's great, Ali was here. I'm sure he's staying three or four nights and he's spending time at the pool. Um, no, Ali is probably there for 12 hours and he's playing a set and then he has to get on a plane to fly somewhere else. And there has to be time to sleep so that he's refreshed so that the next day when he plays uh, Amman or Beirut or Istanbul or London or Tokyo, Things, he's ready and fresh to perform again and to be creative and to deliver the experience that the club goer wants to have. You can't be a successful DJ really unless you love traveling, you know. Maybe for a couple of years you can, but you've got to love getting on that plane, going to different places, revisiting and exploring a little bit. And Ali loves that. Uh, he loves, you know, where that type of situation takes you when you go to a new place. You, you want to meet new people, you want to go to new places, you want to try new food, new drinks, and ex explore everything about that place. And then when I'd go on a weekend and you go from like club to club, maybe have, you have two shows in a night, and you're not sleeping, and you're like, oh my God, I'm never drinking again. I'm like, this is too much for me. But then slowly you get better at it and better at it. Kind of like being in the army, like, you know, when you first join the army, I'm sure, like, you're not used to, like, only two hours sleep. But later, you're like, oh, I have 15 minutes, I'm going to sleep right now. And then you wake up, and then you're fine. Like, you just train your body to deal with that kind of lifestyle. I need sleep, and I love to sleep. Definitely, everybody needs sleep, and uh, it's, it's very healthy. But it's funny, because during the week, if I would sleep only for two hours, 
I, the next day I would be like, oh my God, I only slept two hours. But on a weekend or when I'm on tour and you get only because of your flight schedules or whatever, you get only two hours of sleep, it's okay. You're like, hey, I got two hours of sleep, you know, I can, I can deal with the rest of the night. And that basically shows you it's all a mindset thing. I mean, ultimately, of course, you need sleep, you need rest, but you can, you can do two, three days with a, with a little bit of a, amount of sleep and you can still manage to do your things in the right way. You don't get much sleep over the weekend when you're, when you're doing these kind of events. But not only that, we, 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 we do have a daytime life as well. We have, we have you know, relationships, married, kids. I have a record label to run, or I have a radio show. Um, I do, do you know, a lot of remixes, or work, work in the studio. All of these things are cumbersome of, of what makes a DJ. And also, when we put the events on, this all needs to be worked out, meetings, things that you have to go and see. And then not only that, we have, you know, uh, people that we need all those to see, uh, need to see from a financial point of view, where, where, you know, marketing structures, all this kind of stuff. It, it really is a part of the success has created all of what we need to basically uh, understand and what we need to go through. To, to be able to go to that party and do what we do at the, at, at the other end of it. And, uh, and that is all time, it takes so much time, but it's necessary to do it. Otherwise it doesn't, the wheels of the industry doesn't keep turning. If it just was like, oh, what time was it? Oh, eight o'clock in the evening, oh, right, I'll get some food and then we'll go to the party. All these meetings and things are backed up and, and, and things that you need to know about have not been done. And then it all falls down. So you have to be on top of the game, not just from, from the DJing point of view, but from the nuts and bolts from the industry point of view as well. DJing or playing music for people, it's, it's a, a lonesome life, much like a life of a cowboy. And a life, uh, a life on the road is like a life on the prairie, alone to your words, to your horse and yourself. Yeah. I never went on tour with him and I was used to being like on my own all the time. So I'd be like, see you when you get back. And I had no idea where he would go. So I was like, oh, okay, you're gonna DJ, cool, see ya. And then he would come back and he was like, oh, I'm so tired. And I was like, what did you do? <laughs> like, where have you been? Like, what, what's going on with you? But he never, he never was like, oh, I'm just gonna sit back and chill. Like, he always wanted to do something or go out. So I probably didn't get that. The end of that, like, being tired thing until maybe like two years later into the relationship. I, I think just stay on top of everything. All the DJs just take lots of drugs. I say that because I think some people out, out there actually think that's the case and that's the only way it actually works. Um, most of the DJs I know have had crazy times in their lives and in their careers where perhaps they were experimenting and drinking a lot and doing lots of things. Um, but most of the DJs now uh, that I, who are on top of their game are quite disciplined. Uh, so they have um, a schedule that's pretty intense between, you know, staying fit, uh, because staying fit means playing your best. Staying fit also means a clear mind that allows you to work and run companies. I always make sure that 
you know, Ali has time for Ali. I always, you know, I've introduced him to wellness doctors, to physical therapists. I think that, I think of Ali as a brand. I think of DJs like brands. And I think that, um, like professional athletes, right? They, they, there's wear and tear on the body. This constant travel, this no sleep. So I, you know, I recommend people for him to go see and he listens to me and we work out together. And I think that there's a whole sort of upkeep or maintenance element of his lifestyle that helps keep him going. You know, we're at the gym very early or swimming. We're then straight into the office. Uh, we're having lunch and dinner meetings, which are usually, you know, very rarely do I see any of us having really, you know, really personal, personal time. It's always somewhat mixed, you know. If I'm out with Ali, probably, you know, I'm with Laura, my girlfriend, and Camille, his girlfriend, and we're, you know, talking personal, we're talking into business, and we're going back and forth, and that's kind of how the whole lifestyle is. Everything is mixed. No, <laughs> This isn't a nine to five job. We don't punch in, you know, it's not actually, it is a job because it makes more money, but it, this is our life and we really love what we do. So our personal time and fun time is our work time, you know? So it's very hard to, again, say when, when anything starts or stops. DJ's a bit like mice on the wheel kind of thing, always spinning, you know, always pleasing the next person, the next person, and then forgetting to please yourself almost. You know, you think you're pleasing yourself because everyone's like standing in front of you going crazy, but it's not, it's not really. So yeah, you have to, um, yeah, you have to enjoy the process of doing it as opposed to just turning up, thinking I'm always gonna, I'm gonna enjoy it when I have the day off. You gotta enjoy the whole thing. So. What I feel is life gives you a blessing. The blessing of being successful. When there are millions of people out there that are dreaming to have half of the success that we're having. And when life gives you this blessing, I think you cannot refuse it. We do this because we love it. It comes from the heart and uh, that's what spurs you on, you know. If you love something so much, it doesn't matter where you are, if you're on your own or how tired you are. It, uh, you get in the club and if the show's amazing, it, it, it's worthwhile, it's worth being tired, it's worth not seeing your loved ones. It's, we do this because we love it, no other reason. There's a lot of difficulties along the way. But at the end of the day, I think for all of us, it's that moment that we get to the DJ booth or the stage and we hit play that it all makes sense. When he first stepped in to womb, 
uh, I already knew that he was such a, a you know Japan freak and he knew so much about uh, Japan in every different levels and he's just a great guy you know like he, he works very hard and he respects the country and culture and people and also he knows how to have fun how, how to have great time with people around him Ali, going back to childhood, always had a fascination with Japan. It's always something that he, um, when, when anything Japanese would come on the television when we were kids, he would sort of stop and, and tune in. And uh, over the years when he traveled to Tokyo and Japan, I think he really embraced the culture. He felt comfortable there. Um, and I think Japanese culture, again, is very meticulous. It's very... Uh, there's an emphasis on quality, and I think Ali appreciates those virtues. West Coast, East Coast. Okay, East Coast. I got East Coast. So, I'll stop that board. so far, he's West Coast and New Zealand. Many people cannot even imagine, but uh, is a, there is a big extreme change of emotions. When you are on the stage, you are at the max, and then you, you go back to the hotel, you are alone, you and your your room, most of, most of the times. But uh, I try always to stay with my friends after a big, you know, such, such as in a gig, you know, like, I don't know, big festival, we have the after hours, the after party. That's why we do after party, because then it's like the celebrating of uh, such as, and uh, I love also with Ali many times we do this because we celebrate together the music and the freedom, the, 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 the you know, the amazing thing to stay together and to share something. So uh, for me, it's a continuous celebrating. Of course, not every time with after hours, but uh, even when I go back to the hotel, I uh, I have this adrenaline, you know, that. It's like, I don't know, after a school exam, you know, that you have this, this feeling in the stomach, like but butterflies. And uh, I have this before, during, and after. <laughs> so it's, yeah, special, very special. We skip from country to country in hours. You know, we can play in three countries in 24 hours. Uh, be in Tokyo one weekend and well, one Friday in New York the next. So our, our minds work this way. And that fast paced mindset, that love of technology, which helps us play, helps us travel, helps us communicate, is something that I, f I think we all felt in Japan. And I think we all had that similar, you know, rush, that excitement, uh, and, and felt like we were stepping one day ahead of everybody else. メンタリティが日本人な感じがしますね。人にの気使い方とか、だからすごくあの話しやすいので、いろんなことで、だから逆にあれですね、日本に来た時だけ話すんじゃなくて、でチャットをしながらね、これ美味しかったよとか、そういう話をしながらとか、ね、今どこにいるみたいなことがあのできるのは楽しい友達ですね。はい、日本食好きなんだって言ったら大好きっていうので。じゃあここはここはって言ってあっち行ったりこっち行ったりしてたのに
あのもう毎回あのご飯ばっかり食べてる仲間になってしまいましたみたいな。Kukuzatsu. Yeah. Tamago,、yes. the flavor is Kukuzatsu. So many,、uh, so many things. One, one little piece, so many things. Yeah. 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 こう考えながら食べてくださるからすごく僕もこうあの来ることによって市場に着きに行った時にそのなんていうんですかね、うん、やはり今日今日はこれを食べてもらいたいっていうものをこう選チョイスしてあゆさんにはねオーダーするようにはしてますね。はい Bueno, yo soy, intento ser muy, muy respetuoso con los clientes, entonces、eh, me consta de que desde que abrí、eh, Tickets él ha estado viniendo. Yo no lo conocía antes de, de. No sigo mucho la música, ahora sí, por otros motivos. Entonces,、eh, la verdad que no he tenido mucho contacto personal con él, ya que yo suelo estar más en cocina, pero sí que de hecho lo conocí más como cliente que como músico. Es decir, es una persona que cuando se sienta a la mesa es una persona. Que se toma muy en serio el ir a comer,、eh, es un gran、uh, gourmet, es una, un foodie, un gran conocedor de la comida y, y sobre todo se lo va a pasar bien, que a mí es la gente que me interesa, gente con respeto y que lo pase bien. Si estoy en cualquier lugar del mundo, Bulgaria o lo que sea, le digo, vale, ¿dónde está el mejor plato de comer? Y él te asegura que tiene cuatro o cinco lugares. That are just amazing. It doesn't have to be high end, it just has to be good food. And he is one of these DJs that, that has the love and the knowledge of where to eat around the world. Because it's important to eat good, it makes you feel good, you feel happy by what you've eaten, and you can go into your gig you know, very, very positive, knowing that you've eaten well. And, and it has a, an effect on you, it really does. I mean, even more so than any, before, and the, any time before in our lives now, that we are very health conscious by what we eat and how it makes you feel. He had a passion with gastronomy, with, with food.、Um, he's one of the guys, do you understand? He's eating with all those chefs, and、uh, everybody knows him. And、um, that's a nice feeling that, that somebody is so emotional with food, but also h a v e a passion with it. Because it's not only food, it's more than that. あとコース料理は確実に DJ と同じなのでアペタイザーがあってなんか適当にそういうサラダがあってメインがあってデザートがあるのは DJ と同じなので DJ が自分たちがなロングセットを特にやってると「はい」って「ワインでございます」とか、ね「サラダでございます」とか言いながらメインディッシュは最後の方に取っとかないと結局一番初めにデッシュ出しちゃうとその後いくらサラダ出してもダメじゃないですか。DJs are people loving food. It's that creative edge, you know. And when you travel around and actually spend most of your meals in restaurants,、uh, you start to really pick up like taste, you know. And Ali is a man with a superb taste. And most people with taste love not only food, but art, fashion, and other things and culture, you know. And when, I mean, for us, like Ali and I,、uh, one of the top things next to music is. The top investments in culture is food, you know, that taste, the experience, you know, they're both experiential events, you know, like both with, it's like embodying more than one sense, you know, and there's something about that that's just like the best thing in life, you know, good food, good music, good friends, throw some good sex in there, you can't ask for anything else. It's a true story. I thought it was. It was good, it could have used a bit more seasoning for my, you know, for, for, for my palate, but, but very, very nice. Yeah, very nice. The, the, the meat was fantastic, very tender.、Um, just、uh, for me, a bit more seasoning, but I could tell it was made with love, so congrats. He is the number one DJ you call wherever you are in the world and say, hey, you know, where am I going to eat tonight? <laughs> and he's been there, he's found it. It is amazing, so.、Um, 
It's, uh, yeah, it's all about balance and finding something outside of the DJ booth to keep you sane. Whether it, your family's obviously a very important part of that, but it's having other interests as well. Staying at the top is the fucking hardest thing. You know, being in this industry for 30 years and consistently pushing yourself and we, society wants a new hotel, a new club, a new restaurant, a new DJ. We all want new, new, new. Point is, you've got to reinvent yourself, you've got to stay connected to globally playing to young generation while you grow older and grow older gracefully. You know, you expect that there's always going to be someone new. And that's good. That's good for all of us, right? But learning and understanding that is more important. And it's more important to look at the long haul and the bigger picture rather than the five minutes of fame. The only positive that you can find when you're at the top of the game is to be able to be creative and reinvent yourself. That's the only thing, because you don't want to do it for the money, you already have money. You don't want to do it, you know, to be number one, you're already number one. So, you already proved your point. So it's not about the ego, it's not about the money. The only way to stay there is for it to be about the love and, and the creativity and the challenge to reinvent yourself. It's quarter two, so you might have made your interview. Could be rocking and rolling. A lot of dance music in Holland. Everybody is really into the dance music. Yeah. People get spoiled real easily, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you notice that when you're in Holland? That you notice? Yeah, well, totally. Like this guy right here. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's so spoiled. Like they know the music. They know how to, you know. Do yeah. you experience that as well, or? Yeah, but I, you know, I, I honestly don't have even time to think about that. You know, like I'm, I'm just jetting from one gig to another, or from one, you know, uh, airplane to another, or. Uh, one studio to another. Are you still enjoying that life? Or? I absolutely enjoy it, yeah. Still? The day I stop enjoying it is the day I'll, I'll You'll hang quit. Yeah, I'll quit, yeah. So it's, it's not that glamorous, you know. Sometimes, yes, we play, take a private jet to get to certain parties, but I've always said if you have, um, if I've got to take more than two flights to get to a venue, then I'll take a private jet. If not, I'll take domestic airline. And the thing is with domestic airline, you can never guarantee that your one or two flights is going to get you where, where you need to be. There's always uh, uh, aircraft, um, uh, malfunctions, there's always strikes, there's always mistiming of, of connecting flights, you can be waiting on delayed flights for hours, and you're just sitting there, you know, <laughs> three hour delay. <laughs> what do you do with that three hours? You know, you see this terminal which you, just people watching, you know. So, and this is what takes the time, man, and the energy, it sucks energy out of you, but you still have to, have to, you know, step up, you still have to be within sight that fire that, that basically gets you to go and do what you're doing.
I, I never forget, Ali used to point to some of these picture on the wall of the big DJs in the world that uh, he was looking at the picture and then looking at me, mom, one day I'll be as famous as this person. And another, another uh, big dream that he had, he said, one day, can you imagine one day I'm going to travel all over the world to see the whole world. And he's the shine on his eyes as he was passionately talking about uh, being one of those big DJ that sh pointing to the picture and seeing the whole world and experiencing the whole world. That shine is something that I will never forget. Sexy than the other. This is, uh, and I think uh, he's agree with me. It's just like, oh, you're here to have a good time. Let's go. Let's fucking party. I think he enjoys vampires, and from from what I can gauge, I know he had a collection of some kind of uh, vampire type magazines on his on his uh, coffee table as well. So, you know, they brought us horse. That means, really, I'm not kidding. And a Japanese restaurant, raw horse. Okay, you're gonna tell us. Or, yeah, yeah, like sluts. No, no, no. Horse. You know the ones that are. Oh, horse. Yeah. I think it's a horse. <laughs> no, no, I would love that. Ali picked up an extra hobby on top of that, is to be a food connoisseur and post every piece of dish that he's seen in the last two years on Instagram. <laughs> if you don't know me, get the fuck off the bus, please, in the nicest possible way. Because if I came up to you and said, hey, how you doing? Can I come to your house? The answer would be, Fuck you. So that's your fucking answer. Get the fuck off the bus. 